بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Um, uh, what I'm going to do is like maybe uh, since we got like an hour, maybe talk for 40 minutes, 40, 45 minutes, and then maybe have like a Q&A session for 15, 20 minutes, inshallah. Or if you, or if you want to have it for longer, I got no problem, inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa taala in the Quran, in one ayah. He explains to us the stages of our lives, that the, the difference in age, how our age changes and what we're supposed to do, state of weakness, state of strength. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Allah created you in a state of weakness and after that state of weakness, He brought you or gave you a state of strength. And after that state of strength, he brought you back to a state of weakness and gray hair. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse tells us about the three stages that all people go through. When we are kids, when we're young, we're weak. People need to help us, especially our parents. And then you reach the prime age at which you are supposed to do things in your life. The stage of strength after weakness. And that's the age that most of you are in. The youth, the teens, young adults, you know, maybe 30 year olds want to be part of that too, that's fine. But once you get older and start getting gray hair, you get weak again. And Islam, if you look at the history of how the da'wah spread from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, most of the uh, people who accepted his message were not the elders of Quraysh. Very few of them were the elders, old people. Most of them were young. And we look from our history, how many of the scholars were in their teens? Abdullah ibn Abbas, Ibn Mas'ud, Aisha radiallahu anha, Usama bin Zayd, you know, Abdullah ibn Umar. All of them, them were youths, teenagers, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died. And it is at that age, that all human beings are more energetic, they have more, more eagerness, they're you know, less lazy, and they want to do everything. And that's why obviously we see that at that, it's that period that we go to college, finish high school, go to college, do things, make something of ourselves. But as Muslims, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That I have not created man and jinn except for the purpose that they worship me alone. As Muslims, we can never forget this ayah. Our main purpose of existence is to worship Allah, is to implement the Sharia of Allah in our lives and spread the message of Islam to everybody around us so that the entire society can flourish together. So at that age of strength, or those 15, 20, 30 years of strength, it is mandatory upon us that we don't slacken when it comes to the deen. Just like we don't slacken when it comes to the dunya. We go to college, get educated, with the intention of getting a good job, get married, have money, drive nice cars. So a lot of times Islam takes a back seat in our lives. So as Muslims, we can't have that happening. Nowadays we have, let's suppose, in America, and this is not the case in other countries, in Europe or other places in Western countries, the situation of the Muslims there are not like the situation of Muslims in America. And by that I mean, the Muslims in America generally are more educated. Almost everybody has at least a bachelor's degree in something. But the situation in UK or in Australia or other parts, it's like, you know, you'll find a lot of youth who are high school, you know, they never went to college or something like that. But alhamdulillah here, it's not that type of situation. But the point is, we need Muslim doctors, Muslim lawyers, Muslim teachers, Muslim engineers. Not some doctor with a Muslim name or an engineer with a Muslim name. There's a difference. Just having a Muslim name and not knowing anything of the deen and someone who is a Muslim first and then a doctor, engineer, whatever it may be. 
that way you can be the most effective in society. If you know your deen, first and foremost, and then whatever profession that Allah blesses you with, the intelligence, the ease that you go do whatever you like to do. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in the Quran that Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu taqullaha wal tanzur nafsum ma qaddamat lighad. O you who believe, have the taqwa of Allah and be mindful of what you put forth for tomorrow. What taqullah, fear Allah, inna Allah khabirun bima ta'amalun. Indeed, Allah is well aware of the deeds that you do. وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ نَسُوا اللَّهَ فَأَنْسَاهُمْ أَنفُسَهُمْ Do not be like those who forgot Allah and Allah caused them to forget themselves. And that is exactly what's going on with the Muslims in the West. If you ask the average youth, they are struggling. Am I American? Am I Muslim? Am I Pakistani? Am I Egyptian? It's like being pulled from all different directions. And at the end of the day, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Allah has been forgotten in their lives, and Allah caused them to forget themselves. What's your identity? Who are you? What are you? This is a question that every youth has to ask themselves. That what am I doing here? Why am I going to school? What is my purpose? Who am I? So if you forget Allah, Allah will cause you to forget yourself. And this is what we see even from the elders, our parents, many of them, the parents' generation. That we find, mashallah, our fathers working 8, 10, 12, some even work 16 hours, depending on what type of job they do. Never around. The mother's going crazy trying to keep track of the kids. And most of our parents are immigrants. Maybe they don't even speak English properly with the proper accent and whatnot. They don't understand the lingo. They don't understand what's going on in school. I've had, subhanAllah, I've seen brothers and sisters hooking up with some kafir over the phone right in front of their parents. But their parents can't understand the words that they're using. Is just standing outside the masjid and calling his girlfriend up, and the father's talking to me. I'm like two feet away. I'm like, what's going on? So we have these type of situations. But at the same time, of course, we have, mashallah, many youth who are serious, who are interested, and they're wandering around trying to find the most authentic sources to learn Islam from and be the best Muslims that they can be. I don't have the time to go into details from the ayat of Surah Al-Kahf, but in your own times, when you are free, inshallah, please read through that surah, especially the verses dealing with Ashab Al-Kahf, the people in the cave. But briefly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it very clear that they were young people. And they were, you know, just fed up with the society around them. So much shirk. They had no other choice but to seek refuge with Allah in a cave. Our situation is exactly like theirs. We have shirk around us. We have zina, khamar, maisir, all of these things calling us from all different directions. And as Muslim youth, we have to follow the footsteps of Ashab al -Kaf. A group of them got together, they encouraged one another, motivated one another, understood each other's problems, and they separated away from the evils of society. You can never survive alone. Never. SubhanAllah, when I was a kid, my mother used to always tell me, that remember when you die, you need at least four people to carry your body. So at least have four good friends. Beautiful advice. Alhamdulillah, I have you know, probably five times more than that, but, <laughs> but Alhamdulillah, this is the thing, that the mentality we need. A lot of times what happens, some youth go into an extreme. They feel a zeal for it, and that's good. All of a sudden, Allah guides them. They were jahil for, you know, the, throughout their teen life. They go to college, read some books, hear a couple of lectures. Oh, he's upon the sunnah, the best one there is. So he's going to isolate himself away from every Muslim because everybody's deviant. 
he received revelation now, so he, he's, he's a different class. So he separates himself away from the Muslims. Eventually, these brothers and sisters, and wallah, I've seen this with my own eyes, they stay on the sunnah by themselves, do whatever they can, as much as they can by themselves. Eventually, within a year or two, they get fed up because there's nobody around them. And they go back to the same garbage that they were doing five years ago. You can't survive alone. Allah made human beings social creatures. You need people around you. You need someone to talk to, a group of people to talk to. So take this lesson from the people of the cave, the youth, that they were together. Always stick together, the Muslim youth. Help one another. If you learn something, share it with the other. If the others learn something, they should share it with you. It should be a relationship of mutual respect, mutual understanding, mutual motivation. That if I slip, you know, don't start putting it off, you know, knocking on my doors of my parents, oh, your son or daughter did this, you know, backstabbing me, pretending to be my friend, but they give me away. Rather, you advise the person first. And this is the way of the Muslim. This is the hadith in Sahih Muslim. Abdullah ibn Masood said that the Prophet wasallam said, Whoever hides the sin of his brother in this dunya, Allah will hide his sin on Yawm al Qiyamah. Allah says, Yawma tubla is sara'ir. This is a day when all secrets will be exposed. You don't want that to happen to you. So if you see your fellow brother or sister do something that is haram, advise him once, twice, thrice, four times. Don't just go and expose and gossip about that person right away. Because, وَخُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ ضَعِيفَ Allah created man weak. That's why we're human beings. We are weak. And there are so many shayateen around us. It is natural for someone young, full of hormones, to slacken here and there, to slip, to fall off the edge for a few days. But it's not like we make takfir upon the kid and say, you know, get lost or whatever it is. If Allah has blessed you with the ilm that you know what your sister or your brother did is wrong, then be a good Muslim to him or her. Because all of you guys and girls know, I don't care how big your beard or even if you're wearing niqab, when you do something crappy, you hope that your parents don't know. You don't want that to happen. And you, maybe if you do something wrong, you're making dua to Allah for two things. Don't, don't let my mom or father find out, and please forgive me. So put yourself in the shoes of your brother or sister who commits a sin that you see. Advise one another, have this mutual understanding, and stick to one another. Stick to one another upon the Qur'an and the Sunnah, upon the way of the Sahaba, because they were the best of Muslims. The way they understood the deen was the best way. The way they implemented the deen was the best implementation. So stick to it as much as you can, and you help one another. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encouraged us by talking about the Ashabul Kaf, that إِنَّهُمْ فِتْيَةٌ آمَنُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ وَزِدْنَاهُمْ هُدَىٰ They were youth who believed in their Lord, and Allah raised their iman. This is the blessing that you get. Yes, of course, it's a tough life out there. But if you truly believe in your Lord, Allah will help you. Allah will raise the level of your iman. But make that effort first. Allah did it before, and Allah will do it again. If you follow the footsteps of the people, the pious people before you. What did they do when their society was corrupt and all the filth around? So, these are the best type of youth, of course. But not all youth are this serious. We have some youth, we all know who they are and whose kids they are. Like the deans here and they're like way over there. No salah, no siyam, no nothing. SubhanAllah, when I used to, you know, when I was, in, uh, when I was studying in Texas State, obviously not all MSAs are as serious as they should be. So at MSA meetings, I used to see sometimes brothers bringing in their white girlfriends. This is, a, this is reality. 
So, bro, what what you doing? What does your parents think you're doing? Oh, I'm having an MSA meeting, man. I'm fooling them, right? You know? Okay, your parents aren't here. They can't see you. They can't hear you. But Allah, He is the ever living. He can hear and see you. And always remember that you are ambassadors of Islam, ambassadors of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. What you do in your school, in your college, in your class, whatever it may be, you are what they use as a judgment of the entire religion. And we see that every day. A few Muslims will do something crazy, oh, it's the whole religion's fault. As if people don't use religion in their culture to commit crimes. Every Christmas you hear somebody dressed up like Santa going into a church and killing people. It's the same concept. Somebody looking like a follower of a specific religion, going into a holy place of that religion, or comes home, probably doesn't have a job and he's tired of buying his wife and kids gifts, so he shoots everybody then shoots himself. Same thing. No, he's mad. But the other, the Muslims, when they do it, they're terrorists. This guy's mentally insane. Double standards. So you have to be aware of this. You are judged different. And you should be judged different. Why? Because we are the only ones that worship Allah alone. So we are different from other people, even though all of us are Bani Adam. So in a way, it's good that you're looked at differently because we are different in our faith, in our actions, in our manners. We are supposed to be different. Didn't the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say in the hadith collected in Abu Dawood, narrated by Abu Huraira, that man tashabbaha bi qawmin fa huwa minhum. Whoever imitates a group of people is one of them. We are supposed to imitate the Muslims, the Muslim culture, because we are from Islam. So it's good for us that they look at us different. It will encourage us. It's a bit more of a challenge because we love being challenged. You ask for a challenge, Allah gave it to you. Now live up to the expectations. So everything that you say you do in school and college, you are ambassadors to this religion. Be the best ambassador that you can be. And know that you're not going out there to be all, you know, I'm, I got this such and such degree, I'm gonna get this such and such job, earn this money, buy this car, get this handsome husband or beautiful wife or whatnot. You live in this life for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This world is for us to convey the message of Allah azza wa jal and to show the signs, the beauty of the sharia of Allah. So know this point very well, that you're all ambassadors, Live up to the expectation of a good Muslim. Everything you do and say will come back and haunt you later on. That subhanAllah, if a girl was to ask you guys out, one of you out, and it happens, even if you got a big bushy beard, <laughs> they'll find that attractive too. So it's not going to protect you. There will always be shayateen around to tempt you in some way or another. Even if a sister wears niqab, mashallah, you know, well, they're not going to say mashallah. Yo, you got such beautiful eyes. No matter how much you get cover up, there's a shaitan who will be there to notice something. So these temptations will come. But if you tell them, I am a believer in my Creator, inni akhafullah, as one of the seven people who will be given by the shade of Allah on a day when there is no shade. One of them is when they are called to zina, they reply, indeed, I, I am afraid of Allah, and they turn away. A tremendous reward. Imagine on, the, on Yom Al Qiyamah, when the sun is a hand span above our heads, the whole of humanity is trying to run away from that heat. If you are able to fulfill one of the, this one condition, Allah will provide you shade on that day. What a tremendous ni'mah. So if a guy asks you out, or a girl wants to you know, hook up with you, Explain it to them that we are followers of the Creator. We don't worship our desires. We worship the one who created us. And tell them straight, this is a religion that even you should follow because your father and mother, Adam and Eve, followed the same religion. You will remain disease free. You will remain psychological, you know, you won't have psychological problems and all the other baggage that come with zina. 
it's better for you. So flip it around. Corner them rather than them cornering you. And leave it at that. But as I said, it is very tough to do if you're alone. Maybe if you're with a group of friends. You're walking down your school or college. A girl comes. There's four or five of you. Even if the shaitan tempts your heart, all five of you are not, inshallah, get, get tempted at the same time. Why? Maybe you find that girl attractive, but your friend doesn't. <laughs> you know? So you, you can be there to help one another. So he can remind you, or she can remind you. So always stick together. That's like the first most important point. Upon the Quran and the Sunnah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it very clear in the Qur'an that وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلَنَا The one who strives, makes jihad, struggles in our path, we shall certainly guide them. This is a promise from Allah. Al-Haq, the most truth, truthful of speech, words. Allah never lies. This is a promise from Allah. If you struggle, be patient and just strive. Allah is there to take care of the rest. He will definitely guide you. We live in a time of confusion. And this is like, subhanAllah, you might go to five masajid, talk to five imams, ask him the same question, you'll get five different answers. And you might, and it's, it, it happened to me too. Somebody will say, well, you know, we do this. The other imam who may be from somewhere else, another madhab or this, we do that. What am I as a Muslim supposed to do? Simple question. I'm not from here or there or this madhab or that. No, tell me what am I as a Muslim supposed to do? And these type of attitudes drive the youth away. And this is the responsibility of the elders that you don't create this type of, you know, division this type of environment for your children. It's very hard as it is trying to keep them on the deen. And if you inject more poison or present them with more fitan, it's gonna make it even tougher. Eventually they give up. So many masajid I've been to, hardly any youth. Alhamdulillah in this community it seems like, mashallah, you guys have basketball and all this, library, very attractive. Make use of it. Take advantage of it. Wallahi, I, I, you know, in one, of, in one masjid that where I was the imam for three years, for three years, they had the money, mashallah, you know, all rich doctors and everybody. In three years, I couldn't convince them, can you just make like something small? You don't have to make like a soccer field. And they had seven acres of land behind the masjid. They owned it. For three years, I tried telling them, make a basketball court or something. You guys have the money. No, no, brother, this is, you know, masjid's not for play. <clears throat> I even showed them the hadith from Sahih al-Bukhari. The Sahaba used to have horse riding, spear throwing in front of the masjid. Well, we can't be doing spear throwing now, we'll probably get sent to Gitmo, you know? <laughs> so, whatever our culture is. They used to play. They used to remain physically active. The masjid is the center of all affairs. Family problems, political problems, economical problems. Questions, whatever it may be, the Sahaba used to come to the Masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and that's the environment you need to build. It's not just you pray, leave. You might be praying. If that's the attitude, you find brothers and sisters. For ten years, they'll be praying next to each other. They don't know where they're from, what their full name is, how many kids they got. They've never seen each other's houses. They don't even know what problems they're facing. So alhamdulillah. This is one thing that is good about this culture. It tells you to be friendly, get to know people. This is something that, you know, they teach us in school. So we don't have that, you know, isolation. You're from this country, only stick to these type of people. So that mentality is not there, which is actually from Islam, mashallah. And that's something good that you guys can take out of it. Always remember, every culture, even if they're kuffar cultures, they have something good in them. And as Muslims, we take the best of everything that matches with our religion. If something doesn't match with our religion, doesn't matter if this is the culture of your fathers, grandparents, whatever it may be, we say, Ma salama. That's it. Whatever matches with Islam, we keep. Whatever doesn't, we reject it. That's how you're gonna... It's a purification process every day. 
Research and research. So another problem that we see is the issue of seeking knowledge. You might be confused going to different masajid and this and that. And you have the will to learn. Alhamdulillah. Even if you're bad, you do something, you know, some sins here and there. At the end of the day, you feel something in your heart and you want to be a good Muslim. All of us, inshallah, are like that. But there is a problem when this happens. We are so motivated, so into learning, that we cross the bounds of akhlaq. We don't focus on that. We want to learn, learn, learn. It's, it's about competition. And you know where this competition comes from? And I'm very sorry to say it comes from our parents. I'll tell you why. When you go to school, your mother and father is going to sit you down. The child of Fulan got A, what you get? B. This is how we're all raised. The sense of competition doesn't matter how beat the other people around you. You got to do better than the other. How am I going to show my face in front of so-and-so? What happened? He got a scholarship at this university and you can't even get into a community college. <laughs> you know, this is the way parents talk. It's all about competition. But what did the Sahaba used to do? The greatest example that you can give is of Abu Bakr and Umar. Whenever there was something good, Abu Bakr always used to be a beat Umar. And Umar tried so hard to beat him, but he couldn't. When it came for time of Sadaqah, Umar gave half of his wealth. Let's see Abu Bakr beat me now. Abu Bakr came and gave all of his wealth. Subhanallah. This is the way of the Sahaba. Compete in terms of Akhirah. In the dunya, Muslims need to be brothers and sisters of one another. You need to help one another. Not put your foot over somebody else's face and say, I made it, he didn't, who cares? This is a concept that came from the kuffar. What do they say? Ends justify means. Doesn't matter how you get there as long as you get there. And this is completely the opposite of Islam. You will never reach Jannah unless your means are good. It's the opposite concept. So we have ideological attacks that subhanAllah we see existing in the families that we don't do research. Where did it come from or is this concept really in line with Islam or is it against it? So as Muslims give up that sense of competition in terms of dunya related issues with one another. Compete in terms of akhirah. Who can do more righteous deeds than the other? So we take this cultural idea, put it into practice, and we see that it creates a mess. So and so went to this sheikh, sat with this sheikh. Okay, I can do that too. I have called, I got sheikh, you know, Google Ibn Yahu. You go to, you know, you see these brothers and sisters every day, they're shooting up new fatawa. Where'd you find it? I googled it. This is not the way to learn your religion. Throughout the history of Islam, never was Islam self-taught to anybody. Allah taught Jibreel alayhi salam, spoke to Jibreel alayhi salam. He came down, spoke to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. And he spoke to all of, the, of humanity. Look at the second generation. Were they self-taught? No. Nope. They used to go to the Sahaba. And they would give a whole isnad whenever they narrated something. Look at the scholars of the past. Nobody was self-taught. But in this era of the internet, I don't have time to go to the masjid, listen to a two-hour lecture. Here, sahihalbukhari.com. Okay, I know what it means. No, you don't. You just read it. You have no idea about the fiqh behind the hadith, or the ayah, or what to do, or what not to do. The ulama spend years, 40, 50, 60 years of their lives trying to figure things out. You can't just go on Google and find out in two seconds. So you have to be very careful, brothers and sisters, that we become, sometimes we become too confident in our abilities. The deen is something, is very, very, it can be dangerous for you if you use it in the wrong way, or approach it in the wrong way. You will be completely away from the straight path. So be patient. If you want knowledge, you want to strive hard as a Muslim, you truly need to make jihad fi sabilillah. It's not easy as pie. 
You need to struggle. Look at the scholars of the past. You know, and obviously in Arabia, and even in back then, they didn't have nice shoes that we wear today. They'd walk around barefoot, travel, walk for months, ride donkeys for months, trying to hear one hadith from this sheikh over there, or go to another place. Look at Imam Bukhari. Traveled all around collecting a hadith of Rasulullah Every scholar that you can think of, they struggled bi'ithnillah. They were poor. They gave up all of their wealth to seek the knowledge of the deen. They struggled. And when you struggle for anything in life, you learn to value it more. This is human nature. Maybe you want to buy a car, brothers. Well, mashallah, my, many sisters are into cars too, but whatever, you know, you don't find them too much, but some of them are. Maybe you got a job as a student, you're trying to save up, your dad's going to help you with some of the money, you're working very hard. And then you, that day when you get your car, I bought this with m most of my money, or almost all of it, you feel proud. You feel good about it. And then you'll feel bad if somebody scratches it, or your younger brother and sister drops juice in the seat or something, or something happens. You get mad. Why? Because you struggled to possess that thing. When things come easy to you, we think it's like worthless. So nowadays, Allah made knowledge widespread, but ignorance is even more widespread. It's so easy. You want to learn Tajweed? There are so many websites. Videos of the shuyukh, all the everything, the rules, everything nicely explained. You can repeat a hundred times after it, whatever it may be. Very nice softwares, whatever it may be. Very easy, but we don't value it the right way because we don't struggle when it comes to seeking that stuff. So this is the human nature. Don't let shaitan deceive you. Islam is the most valuable thing in your life. Subhanallah, the scholars used to say, doesn't matter what happens in your life, say Alhamdulillah that you're Muslim. You know, Allah raised you in a Muslim family. Or if you were, you know, something else before, Allah, you know, revealed the message to you, opened your heart and you became Muslim. This is the greatest blessing that you can have. Not money, not education, not nothing. Because one, the moment you die, Nothing in this dunya will matter except for the deeds and your iman. That's it. These are the only two things you can take to the grave. And these are the only two things that are going to matter on Yom Al-Qiyamah. So you have to learn that this is the most valuable thing. And go step by step like that. A beautiful ayah which will show you the true meaning of being Muslim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, that وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا Indeed, we have made you a nation that is just, balanced, always upon the middle path. لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ And you have, you testify over mankind. You testify over mankind as Muslims. وَيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا And the messenger is testifying is a witness over all of you. This is a severe responsibility that Allah put on the shoulders of us as Muslims. We are a witness over the rest of mankind. To understand this ayah, you have to go and learn the hadith related to it. This is uh, narrated by Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu an, and it's collected in the Sunan of Al-Nasa'i and Ibn Majah and also in the Musnad of Ahmed. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, يُدْعَى نُوحٌ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Nuh alayhi salam, the first messenger of Allah, he will be called on the day of resurrection. فَيُقَالُ لَهُ And Allah will ask Nuh alayhi salam, هَلْ بَلَّغْتَ Did you convey the message? فَيَقُولُ And he will reply, نَعَمْ Yes, I conveyed the message. فَيُدْعَى قَوْمُهُ then Allah will call His people. And Allah will ask His people, Hal ballagakum? Was the message conveyed to you? Now these kuffar, we know everybody rejected Nuh alayhi salam. They will reply to Allah, Ma atana min nadirin wa ma atana min ahad. Nobody came to warn us, no, not even one single person came to us. 
So then Allah will turn to Nuh and ask Nuh alayhi salam, Man yashhadu lak, who is going to bear witness that you are speaking the truth? And Nuh alayhi salam will reply to Allah, Muhammadun wa ummatuhu. Subhanallah. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and his ummah will testify that I conveyed the message. This is the responsibility that Allah gave to all of us. We are a witness over all of humanity about the risala of all the anbiya. In Islam, there is nothing called adolescence. Either you're young or you're adult. The moment you reach puberty, you expose yourself to the fire, you are responsible over your own actions. You're a man and a woman. Many times we find kids when they're 10, 11, 12 years old, they can't wait to grow up. Then they reach puberty, they still want to be baby. What's going on? Can't make up your mind? Because they see the reality of the world, how tough it is. So they want to go back to their shell. But in Islam, that phase that we learn from other cultures doesn't exist. You're young and you're adult. The moment you reach puberty, you're an adult. And this again is for the parents. That when your son or daughter reaches that age of puberty, maybe you're making some de decision in the, you know, something related to your family. Obviously you don't have to take whatever they say, but put them in the table, the round table when you have a meeting, something happened in the family. Maybe an uncle from overseas did something to you and you gotta talk with your wife and plan what you gotta do and this and that. Bring them in the conversation. Let them feel that they are adults and teach them this responsibility. That you will be faced with these, these type of problems, this is how you have to solve them. Prepare them, because they are the leaders of the future. Don't be like, man, like 14 years old, what does, what does he or she know? No, he or she knows a lot. Because they go to a very, they're exposed to a very filthy society. That they see problems that you never even heard of growing up. In Muslim societies. So let them feel that, wait, you're an adult, teach them this responsibility, that you are responsible for your statements, your actions, and everything. No more, you're not a kid no more. So it's the parent's job to teach them these things. And another problem that we see, and I'll do two more problems, inshallah, this is like general issues, so the most common things that you see. One problem is obviously that the feel of, you know, being mocked at. A lot of times we find youth, they don't want to be really out there and be known. You find guys, his name is Muhammad, they want to say, you can call me Mo. And you can be like, where's Larry and Curly, you know? So that's who they are. You know, it's like, uh, sisters want to change their name. I, I have one sister, her name was Fatima, it's like, she called me Fatty. It's like, I don't think you're going to like it if I call you Fat. But, you know, that's just how it is. They don't want to be known. Some kids have this problem. And they're afraid that they'll be mocked at. No, no, it's okay, don't tell them. Well, you got the beard, you got the hijab, you can't hide it. <laughs> you know? So, and then we have many pro youth. SubhanAllah, you find sisters, maybe they walk out of their house, go, go to school with the hijab. The moment they get in their car or go to campus in the parking lot, they take it off. Convertibles, you know. <laughs> so it happens. Of course, this is very bad. But at the same time, you need to understand why they do this, or why are they afraid. The Prophet ﷺ made it very clear in the hadith in Sahih Muslim, that بَدَأَ إِسْلَامُ غَرِيبًا وَسَيَعُودُ كَمَا بَدَأَ غَرِيبًا فَتُوبَ لِلْغُرَبَاء Islam started out as something strange, it will end up being strange. So Tuba, which is a tree in Jannah, for those who are strangers. This is the greatest gift, greatest information message, for sure, you're going to end up being a stranger. It's going to end up being strange. But remain strange and tuba for you. How are you going to get the tree in Jannah unless you really are in Jannah? So that's what he was saying. Be patient, even if people are mocking you. Look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran. That, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ أَجْرَمُوا كَانُوا مِنَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا يَضْحَكُونَ Indeed, those, those disbelievers those who reject Allah's message, they look at the believers and they laugh at them. And that's exactly what goes on today. Oh, you are terrorist. They might go, once my wife was coming, you know, in, in our apartment, and she, mashallah, wears niqab and everything. So, you know, I was at home, she was bringing pizza from the restaurant, right? 
So one, one of our neighbors, what you got in there, a bomb? So my wife replied, no, I got drugs for your brother. <laughs> so, <it's> like, <laughs> so <laughs> sisters don't do that if you're going to be alone. She knows that I was just upstairs. If something had happened, she could call me down. But <laughs> so don't do that when you're alone. So, but anyways, so you're going to have people say stuff like that. You know, they're going to laugh at you. Just like Allah says, the disbelievers laugh at your, laugh at the believers. وَإِذَا مَرُّوا بِهِمْ يَتَغَامَزُونَ And whenever they pass by them, they smirk at them, wink at each, you know, they mock. They pass comments with one of them, oh, look at her, man, look at her, what, what the heck is she wearing? Man, did you see the beard on that guy? He looks nasty. <laughs> looks like a bum in the street. So they say all these things. And Allah is informing us that this will happen. وَإِذَا انْقَلَبُوا إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهِمُ انْقَلَبُوا فَاكِهِينَ and when they return to their own people, they would return joking. They're going to talk about you even more. He's going to go home, tell his parents what crazy people he saw today, how he was afraid. You know, <laughs> so I guess the kids are funny, funny. It's like once when I was moving, I had a, you know, obviously uh, put your clothes in a bag and go down and put them in your car, right? So I probably, this kid was probably like 10 years old, maybe even younger, right? So I'm wearing my toe, walking down with a bag, and it was long, right? So he, he got scared, he's like, he probably thought I got a dead body up there or something. So I'm like, yeah, run, run, go tell your parents. And he got even more scared when I said that, I was like, yeah. So he's like, you know, if they, if they laugh at you, enjoy it, you know, turn it into a joke, say alhamdulillah, enjoy it, you know, they'll, they'll see that, wait a minute, it's like, you know, ease up the tension a little bit. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues that وَإِذَا رَأَوْهُمْ قَالُوا إِنَّ هَؤُلَاءِ لَضَالُّونَ They say to one another that you are misguided. That these are the deviant people. How can you dress like this, walk like this, talk like this? It's like, you know, you go to college, you got a girlfriend? No. What, are you gay? You know, that's like their first question. Like if you hate them so much, why are you allowing them to get married all over the place? Simple as that, you know. So it's like, you know, they'll, they'll say that you are the misguided one. وَمَا أُرْسِلُ عَلَيْهِمْ حَافِذِينَ Allah did not send them as watchers over you. Allah never appointed any kafir to watch over what the Muslims are doing. فَالْيَوْمَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنَ الْكُفَّارِ يَضْحَكُونَ On the day of judgment, the believers will laugh at the disbelievers. So brothers and sisters, Allah clearly tells us, you will be mocked. You will feel strange, but don't give it up. Remember, the prime goal is be focused. As Muslims, we are supposed to have vision in what we do. Don't just think about what's going to happen tomorrow or two days or next week. You know, it's like a lot of times you find youth, what's going on, brothers? Like, don't do this, this is haram. It's all right, I'll hook up with her today. I can think about what happens two months down the road. This is wallahi, some people give that type of reply. What if you commit this zina today and tomorrow morning you don't even wake up, you die in your sleep? As a, in the state of Azani, what are you going to do then? So as Muslims, you're supposed to have vision. And the vision is supposed to reach Yawmul Qiyamah, not just this dunya. So think about the future after death. People mocking you today, calling you strange. But a day will come, inshallah, when you will have the last laugh. That's what you look for. And the next problem, and after this, inshallah, I'll open to Q&A, is the issue of bad companionship. And I'll, you know, summarize again. I can't overemphasize this point of keeping yourself with good company. Abu Huraira radiallahu an said that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith collected in Abu Dawood, that a rajulu ala dini khalilihi, a person is upon the deen, upon the religion of his friend. So be watchful, be mindful of who you befriend. Again, what do your parents say when you're in school? Hang around with the good students, right? When they do homework, sit with them so you can learn from them, they'll benefit you. The good students. So this sense of having good companionship is ingrained in us since we are born. Be with the good kids, the well-mannered kids. Similarly, 
As the Prophet sallallahu said, be with the kids who are upon the deen. You are going to be on the deen of your friend. You want to walk like them, talk like them. This is what we do. So find yourself good friends. And this is my advice to the brothers and sisters. If you've been blessed by Allah, you have a little bit more knowledge compared to the other you know, youth around you. Don't get you know, uh, arrogant about it. But be there, be friendly, open your doors. Maybe you wear niqab and you have a sister who's wearing tight pants and t-shirt. She doesn't know the importance of hijab. Don't shun her off. No, I can't be a friend with her. She's deviant. If you're afraid of your own self, fine. Take another couple of niqabis with you or proper jilbab, abaya wearing sisters. The four or five of you go, befriend that girl. Be friends with her. Hang out with her. Chill out with her. Don't talk about hijab from day one. Maybe she doesn't recognize her creator the proper way. Because any woman who recognizes her, her, her creator will definitely cover up the proper way. Start with Tawheed, which is the first da'wah that all of the Anbiya started with. Make friends with them. Open your doors for the other Muslims who are less practicing than you to come to you. Subhanallah, sometimes, you know what I do? I, I don't like saying it and I don't encourage it. But I have a limit in the way I play it. So I have a play PS3. All right? I don't, obviously, I don't have the time to play with it all day long. Sometimes I take kids from the masjid. You know, let's play some Madden. If I beat you, I'm going to talk to you for 10 minutes about a hadith. That's the condition. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, I'm really good at Madden, so I, I'm fine with that challenge. <laughs> so, uh, you do something. It doesn't mean we go to a you know, nightclub, let's go have fun, let's go dance around, and then we'll talk about the deen. No. Think of halal entertainment, you know, halal entertainment, open the doors for them, let them hang out with you, be friendly. You know, alhamdulillah, you know, everywhere I go, I get very you know, close with uh, young people very well. So I was like, because, you know, I think about myself sometimes, that subhanAllah, you know, I had a hard time learning about the deen. So I want to do something that I want to help the others not face, go through the same things. So. Be mindful, be, you know, be very friendly, have a sister's day out, cook for them, whatever it is, I don't know. Maybe you're learning how to cook from your mom. Give them the bad cupcakes, keep the good ones for yourselves, <laughs> or whatever it may be, alright? So, so yeah, need to keep, your, keep a friendly environment, be open-minded, because if Allah has blessed you with the knowledge, signs of Islam show in you, the way you walk, the way you talk, the way you dress, the way you live, it's a responsibility on you to spread the message. Because it can be seen, of course, what's in our hearts is between us and Allah. But from the outside, on paper, you look like a practicing Muslim. Therefore, keep your doors open for the other less practicing or completely non-practicing Muslims to come to you. Because most likely, they don't... Even if they want to change, they don't know where to go, or who to say to, or who to ask. They can't go to their parents and say, I did such and such and such. Probably get, you know, beat the heck out of them or something. So they have to come to you as a friend, be a friend, help one another. So inshallah ta'ala, I'll stop here. If you've got any question, maybe another point or something as, uh, from the brothers or the sisters, uh, just let me know. I'll do that for a little bit, inshallah. Um, anything? Yeah, brother, go ahead. My name is Shameen. I've been in this country for a long time. I really admire your speech for the youngsters. Only one question that I have for you to remind these youngsters that, you know, when they have older parents, not to be too aggressive with them. Yeah. You know, you know what I mean? Okay, and the second thing, you know, some of these youngsters who have some question and they are a little bit shy about asking you, can you give them email? Yeah. So they can ask you. I really admire you. Thank you. Yeah, sure, no problem. So, I don't know who, whose son or daughter that is. You know, you just been, you know, called out, man. <laughs> I don't know what you're doing at home. 
Now this is something, subhanAllah, we find this a lot, a lot of times that the, you know, the young brothers and sisters, they you know, go overboard. Of course, all human beings, we are limited, we're not perfect, we're not, we don't know everything, because Allah is Al-Alim and Al-Hakim. He is the all-knowing, the most wise. So there will be times, no doubt, that even your father, your mother, who might be in their 50s or 60s, I don't think most of your parents are not that old, but maybe some of you are, even if they're that old, they might make a mistake or two. But at the same time, know this. You're 15 or 20. They're 50. They've already seen this world 30 years more than you. They've seen a lot more things than you. So based on that, they will have... You want to stuff me with water? I got three bottles here, bro. <laughs> Talking too much. You know, fill up your stomach or something. So it's like, but anyways. So you have to understand to be merciful to your parents. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned four things in prayers throughout the Quran. Whenever he mentioned Iman, immediately he mentions Amalus Salihat, righteous deeds. Whenever he mentions obedience to himself, Atiullah wa Atiur Rasul, obedience to Allah and His Messenger. Whenever he mentions Salah, immediately he mentions Zakat. Whenever he mentions La Tushrik Billahi Shay'a, he mentions Birrul Walidain. These four things you will always find it in pairs in the Quran. It is a sign of Tawheed that you are respectful to your parents. Look at the hadith in Sunan ibn uh, 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 at Tirmidhi. Once the Prophet wasalam, was walking up the minbar, he took three steps and he said Ameen three times. Then the Sahaba asked him, Why were you saying Ameen? He said, Jibreel came down and he was making dua and I was saying Ameen with him. One of those du'as was, may the one who finds his parents reach an old age but could not attain Jannah, may he be doomed. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Ameen to that du'a. If you have parents who are old, you still can't attain Jannah, you are one of the most unfortunate people. So you have to be respectful to your parents. Look at Ibrahim السلام, and his father. A kafir forcing his son, who was Khalilur Rahman, to fall into shirk. But Ibrahim السلام, drew a line. Allah created me, I have to obey him before I obey you. But did Ibrahim السلام, ever abuse his father? No, he didn't. He left. He left his father, migrated, left, left the whole place because he had to do what Allah told him. But he never abused his father. Even if you have parents who are irreligious, you have to be kind with them when they need some help. They want you to drive them to the grocery store or they want you to go with them to hold the bags. You got to do these worldly things. When it comes to the deen, nope, I have to worship Al Khaliq. You are also created by him. I have to do what he says. Part of doing what he says is no matter how irreligious you might be, I still have to be kind with you. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you a true story. There's a sister that I know, and I, wallahi, I, may Allah rescue her from her situation. I'm not going to say where she's from, because we, have, uh, we jump into conclusions. If I say she's Egyptian, people are going to Man, Egyptians, man, you see how they are with their kids? You know, <laughs> we tend to do that. So I'm not going to say where she's from. She's, mashallah, wears abaya, jilbab, proper hijab, learning the sunnah, and everything goes to, you know, the masajid behind her parents' back as much as she can. Her parents are Muslim. Her whole families are Muslim. Every single one of them. When she prays, she gets beaten by her own mother to stop praying. This is how her mother is. Her mother doesn't fast, doesn't pray, doesn't do anything. This is her situation. I don't think any one of you have parents like that. And I hope no Muslim youth has parents like that. So say, Alhamdulillah, your father and your mother brought you here. They bring you to this masjid. Your community built you a basketball court. I don't know what they built for the sisters, maybe a kitchen. <laughs> so, but whatever it may be, say, Alhamdulillah, you know, your community wants you guys to come. <laughs> so be, be, be thankful to Allah 
because this is an extreme case. And this is the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No matter what happens to you, as a believer, we look at those who are worse than us and we say, Alhamdulillah. That's why I told you our situation. That some people go through that hell, if you want to put it that way, from Muslim parents, subhanAllah. She can't even pray, gets beaten for praying. Can't wear hijab, gets beaten for wearing proper hijab, subhanAllah. So be respectful to your parents because this is the second most important thing after Tawheed. Part of Tawheed is to be respectful. Alright, so please keep that in mind. Be good to your fathers and mothers. Even if they make a mistake, remember you were crapping on their hands and show a collapse and everything when you were a kid and they didn't say anything and they cleaned you. They cleaned your feces. At least give them respect for that. SubhanAllah, you don't think about it sometimes. How do you feel? You know, if somebody wants to tell you your father or mother got, you know, sometimes it can happen. Old parents, they get paralyzed, something terrible happens. You got to do that to them. So they did this for you. At least give him that, that much respect. Yeah, go ahead, bro. I, um, I, have, I go to college and I have a lot of friends. I hang out with that are, you know, that were, that were Muslim by name, but they're, they're not Muslim. And a lot of them, without saying too much, because they're, they're the little kids, are, are, have lustful addictions, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. And this is a growing epidemic, and I wonder what can be done for, let's say, someone who has a lustful addiction, what can be done for them to get out of it? Yeah. Well, the, the brother raises a good question. And subhanAllah, truth be told, this is not a problem with brothers because some sisters do have the same problem. You know, it sounds very embarrassing, but that is the reality of the world we live in. Well, obviously, it's the fear of Allah that's missing in their life. Secondly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Zuyina lin nasi hubbu shahawati minan nisa. This is the way Allah created man. We desire, we covet the things of this dunya, and the very first thing we run after are women. That's, you know, she stole my heart. She stole, she'll steal a lot more for you too, you know. <laughs> so, but, but you have to keep it under control. Be mindful of Allah. And the most important thing, you can resist things today, tomorrow, day after, a week, month, fast, as the Prophet ﷺ said, the greatest way to suppress your desires is by fasting. Because when you're fasting, you're hungry. You're not really in the mood for anything. You just want to eat when iftar time comes. So that is the greatest protection, fasting. Encourage them to fast. Whether it's brothers or sisters, doesn't matter. Second, you have to be open with your parents. That I have desires, I'm 20, 21, whatever it may be. Help me get married. I don't want to fall into zina. This is the only solution. Being religious, of course, but your mind, your emotions, your body has desires. The only legal way to fulfill them is through marriage. And parents are supposed to facilitate that means. But that's, that's like a growing problem in every community you go to. Brothers and sisters want to get married, but their parents don't understand. They'll finish your education first, this, that. SubhanAllah, we're talking about three, four years. That's plenty of time for shaitan to knock on your son's or daughter's door. Plenty of time. So fasting is a protection. Marriage is a protection. And of course, the greatest protection is the iman itself. So this is, a, this is something that you have to be open about with your parents. That I'm gonna, you know, I'm, please, I'm, I'm begging you. You're my father and mother. Help me and prevent me from falling into zina. I know, mashallah, a, a, a brother. He got married right after he graduated high school, and his parents, you know, hooked him up with another sister who graduated from high school. Whatever it was, they were just 18. They went to college together, the same university. The girl's father was taking care of her financially, and the guy's father was taking care of. Him. You're gonna do it anyways. But let them be together, it prevents fitna. Now, mashallah, they graduated, both have a job. Of course, now they're on their own. But subhanAllah, you see the wisdom? So you as parents need to think, what is more important? 
And subhanAllah, zina is one of the kaba'ir. It is not a simple sin that you can just shrug off. It is one of the worst sins a person can commit. So as a father, as a mother, it is a responsibility, it is an amana. Your kids are an amana from Allah. It's your job to protect them. But of course, when you want to do that, you have to be open about who or what type of person they like. You can't bring a girl that is fit for you. No, he needs to marry someone he can live with for the rest of his life. Or she can live with for the rest of her life as a hus with a husband. You have to be open-minded. Many times we find parents, they want to take this step of marriage. They have no idea what their kids are into, what their mentality is like, what do they like, their dislikes, and then they hook him up with somebody just because it's her, his cousin or her cousin or his best friend's daughter or whatever it may be, and they have no, nothing in common. And the marriage is a disaster. And Muslim families are suffering. Don't think divorce is something, it's a high rate among the kuffar. No, even in Muslim families nowadays, it's increasing. And the root cause is lack of compatibility. People have no say. You find brothers, subhanAllah, we, we, we know who they are. They're hooking up with girls here. Okay, you know, brother, why don't you straighten up your act, seek forgiveness, get married. No, I can't, I gotta marry my cousin. I was already married to her when I was a kid. You know, everybody settled it up. So, subhanAllah, what, what is this? You know? It's like from Jahiliyyah. So this is how many families are. And mashallah, as parents realize this, and especially as fathers and mothers of daughters, the way the Salaf used to do, the righteous predecessors, they'd go around in the masjid, you know, I have a daughter, I'm looking for a nice guy for her, this, that. Nowadays, even if you very politely go to a man's house, I'm interested in your daughter, how dare you come to my house, you know, what are you, give me a heads up. They get angry. It's out of the love, they, it strikes them that I have to say bye to my daughter. Alhamdulillah, that's good love. But sometimes they, they go overboard. As a father, you have to be the one initiating. You are the wali of your daughter. Come to the masajid. MashaAllah, we have a whole Baskin Robbins in the masjid, you know? Muslims from all different colors and flavors. You're bound to find someone good for your daughter. Doesn't have to be from your village all the time. So you have a choice, wide range of choice. Maybe you're from Pakistan, the Pakistanis in your town aren't really husband material. Okay, look for an Egyptian or Somali or whatever it may be. But the point is, as a wali, you have to find the best Muslim man for your daughter. And wallahi brothers, especially the fathers and mothers of daughters, you know this world is very tough for women. We have vicious vultures waiting out there. Some of them are even disguised with the beard and thobes. You don't know who the people are. That's why as a wali, as a father, go out and check. Subhanallah, once a man came to Umar and asked about a guy that was in the masjid. Is he good for my daughter? He, Umar saw him in the masjid all the time. He said, I can't say if he's good because I don't know how he is in business dealings. You have to know everything about the brother. How he is with money, his character. Because the Prophet ﷺ, what did he say? You have to be pleased with the person's deen wa khuluquhu and his manners. How does he deal with other people? And the best way to check brothers and sisters, see how this man is with his mother and sister. Because if a man doesn't know how to respect his own mother and his own sister, will not respect your daughter. See how he is with his mother. But a lot of times what happens, parents lie about their kids when it comes to marriage. You know, you go to somebody, my daughter's the greatest cook, she'll cook everything for you. Then you get married to her, she can't cook anything. <laughs> my son, oh, he was an athlete in school, he had a GPA of 4.0, this, this, that, he majored in three, nothing. So parents kind of overpraise their children. Marriage is one of the few times when riba, backbiting, is allowed. Say all the negative things about that person. Can you live with this person for the rest of, his, of your life knowing that he or she has these flaws? Yes, okay, then you go ahead and do it. So facilitate the marriage, make it easy, and as parents, because you have more experience, you can advise your kids that don't just be fooled, don't judge a book by its cover. You know, don't do that. But at the same time, brothers and sisters, if you know that decent people, decent, a decent brother came to you, approached marriage, because a lot of times sisters, you know, they're kind of wacky. 
They make Salatul Istikhara today. Okay, I feel good, let's go. Let's talk, let's proceed. You come to my house, meet my parents. Then they'll make Salatul Istikhara again about the same issue two weeks later. I don't feel good. Brother, we need to stop. We can't talk no more. Then she makes Salatul Istikhara again. I had a good dream. Okay, you know what? Okay, let's proceed. We don't want to know what you were dreaming, but you know, but that's what it is. If you're making Salatul Istikhara about the same issue 20 times, there's something wrong with you. There's an issue, make Istikhara, move on. Another issue, another Istikhara, move on. This is from the Sunnah. If you are making Istikhara about the same issue and same man 15, 20 times, sister, you know what? Save yourself and save yourself from doing dhulm and save him from being hurt. Don't do that. A lot of times we don't realize that we end up in that prospecting stage, you end up hurting the feelings of the other person. You can't do that. It has to be a balanced approach, has to be mutual respect. If it works, alhamdulillah, if it doesn't, we are still brothers and sisters, our families are still Muslims of one, brothers and sisters of one another. We will, you know, end it in peace, we talk, it didn't work, alhamdulillah, we didn't get married and then figure all this out. Be very respectful of one another. A lot of times you find sisters, you know, and it's unfortunate. This culture really has a way of controlling our minds. They like to be at ease. Make the brother fall in love, it can happen, it's emotional things, it's in a prospecting stage. All of us said, no, I don't feel good anymore. That's it, salam alaikum. It's not so easy for everybody. Some people have weak hearts, soft hearts, not weak hearts. Other people are hard hearted. So be respectful for one another, be wise in the way you approach things, and, and, and go about it. Anything from the sisters? Nothing? Jazakallah khair again, barakallahu feekum, subhanakallahu alhamdulillah, shalallahu alayhi wa sallam.